Most people who live in the rural Midwest have heard the terms cooperative and co-op. Many of us also recognize the large grain storage silos that usually indicate the location of a co-op in the rural landscape. What most don't know is that agricultural cooperatives are a unique kind of business with a unique history. Egg cooperatives really came about as out of a, arose from a need of producers to act collectively to access some of the products they were missing and also be able to market their products effectively. Um, they were facing a period of time when they just didn't have a lot of power in the market and the only way to access that power was really to act collectively and form their own companies. The cooperative business model has actually been around for generations. The cooperative business model has been used a lot in our society, especially here in the middle of the United States. They're a very common form of business because of how agriculture grew up through the world wars and through industrialization and the railroads. Most people do belong to a cooperative and don't even know it, and the primary example of that is a credit union. So a credit union is a financial cooperative, and most people have accounts with a credit union, or maybe they have their electricity delivered through a power cooperative and don't realize it. Maybe they get telephone service from a telecommunications cooperative without even realizing it. So I think a lot of Americans are utilizing cooperatives without even really understanding that structure and know that they do that. One of the reasons cooperatives sprang up a century or more ago was out of economic necessity. For many other kinds of businesses, it's not cost effective to offer goods and services in the lightly populated rural areas. In those instances, co-ops allowed farmers to act collectively and fill the economic void. Co-op was kind of the only game in town for most producers once the co-op got started. So if producers wanted to get access to products or access to services, they had to provide that themselves by forming a cooperative. That still exists today, but we can't observe the counterfactual. Today, we don't get the luxury, and if you want to call it a luxury, of observing what a market looks like without a cooperative, but I think it would look very different. Co-ops make different decisions, and they make those to benefit the membership. It's very different than a non-cooperative firm would make decisions. So if we didn't have co-ops, for example, in the state of Iowa, what would the landscape look like? Would the bigger firms like ADM, Crop Production Services, these other firms, would they choose to have locations in these very rural areas? Would they choose to maintain assets in the same way that co-ops do? And the answer is probably no, because those firms have different motives. They have profitability as their motives, not member benefits as their motives. So co-ops play a number of roles. One is the provision of marketing outlets, um, the provision of missing services or products, pooling of risk, which is really important to the producers, and they provide a place of employment. Americans sought to structure co-ops in ways that ensured fairness and democratic control. They were guided by the Rochdale principles. The Rochdale principles are kind of held up as the gold standard of principles of cooperation for, for cooperative businesses, and it's a set of principles that define how a cooperative business is going to run, and they talk about political and religious neutrality, they talk about economic participation by members, what's important is there's something in there about cash trading by members, and the important part about that is the idea was they're not going to barter and they're not going to extend credit because they didn't want to put the co-op at risk if one member was unable to pay. We don't do that today. Most of our co-ops in the state are, are issuing credit and they operate on a credit basis. The idea is that you're not putting the co-op at risk if one member is unable to pay. Other Rochdale principles, democratic control, sharing of the profits by the membership. Concern for community is a big one that gets lost. And I think this was one of the things that makes a co-op much different at a, in a rural community scale than a non-cooperative firm. There's this link with the community that you just don't get in non-cooperative firms. There's the intent to foster education in the community, provide education for its membership, be involved in the community at a level that other firms don't necessarily have that requirement or have that culture to suggest that. 
We look at the co-ops that exist today in Iowa and the agricultural cooperatives and it's hard to imagine that those were struggling businesses or those are businesses that in any other legislative environment may not have made it. And what I mean by that was in the late 1800s and early 1900s, there was legislation coming into place at the federal level that was intended to address attempts at monopolization. So big companies would get together, big firms would get together and create these trusts to control prices, to control flows of goods and services and benefit from that. When agricultural producers started to act collectively and form these cooperative associations, they were brought up on some of these antitrust suits and those bringing the suits against them won because they were acting collectively. There was the Sherman Act and the um, Clayton Act. Until Capra Volstead came along in 1922, there was no clarification to how agricultural producers were intended to be treated under this law. And so Capra Volstead really clarifies that language and is, provides the primary exemption agricultural producers have and cooperatives have to antitrust law. Without that, we would not see agricultural cooperatives or many other cooperatives that exist today because it, it could be perceived as an intent to monopolize or an intent to improve prices for a, a subset of people. One of the earliest ways co-ops benefited member farmers was by giving them access to railroads and thereby access to regional and national markets. The growth of the railroads was impactful to agricultural cooperatives because it really opened up the market for producers both to access goods and services and also sell their products. The problem with that was unless you had access to the railroad in terms of loading or access to someone who owned a spot on the railroad, you really were subject to the terms of trade of, of that person. And so without that access to the railroad, without acting collectively and maybe building their own grain bin, they again had no control over the, the goods they were going to receive and the prices they would get for selling their grain on the railroad. Every farm cooperative started with a group of farmers coming together to pool their resources and create a business that benefited all members. The personal investments of these pioneers have benefited farmers and other rural Americans for generations to come. That's one thing that people today have a hard time connecting with is understanding the sacrifices that were made by those who initially started a cooperative. We don't see, in the state of Iowa anyway, new grain and farm supply cooperatives starting up because of the enormous capital requirements to get into this business. Most of the co-ops that we have in Iowa today, and I would venture to say agricultural co-ops across the country, started because 15 or 20 producers got together and each chipped in $100 to build, for example, a grain bin, a storage facility, and it grew from there. So years and years and years of profitability and retaining that profits was required to get to the size of co-ops we see today. It would be hard to imagine a group of producers, 15 or 20 or even 100 producers coming together today and collectively having enough capital to start a co-op of any size. This has been a slow progress over the last 100 years in the state of Iowa.